All right, guys, so I'm going to try to do this one as best I can. Um, so the question yesterday was how to uh, develop particularly your upper chest. Um, and so when we were talking about our upper chest, we are talking about uh, mostly like this higher uh, pectoral, although if you really want it to be framed, you should be working on this anterior deltoid as well. And I want to talk about a couple concepts when I'm trying to think about what kind of program I want to develop for uh, trying to develop the upper chest. And so the main difficulty of developing the upper chest is trying to make sure that when I am uh, programming my exercises and executing those exercises that I'm not recruiting my uh, anterior deltoid uh, in correspondence with, uh, to kind of help out that uh, upper pectoral muscle. So um, I actually dropped this down for a reason. So um, unlike your uh, pec major or something along those lines, uh, your lower pecs, your pecs like attach here into your uh, humerus and then they come across and they generally attach here in the sternum. But the upper ch chest uh, is actually attached to the clavicle. So this bone right here, so you can feel all that meat that's underneath that bone right here, that is coming up kind of at an angle here and then coming up into uh, that clavicle. So when we are trying to develop the upper chest, we want to make sure that we are uh, paying attention to the primary purpose of this muscle. And it's not really the most functional muscle to, uh, as far as work goes, because you basically have to, anytime that you're humorous, your elbow, I'm going to say your elbow specifically, uh, comes up at this angle. Um, that's when we're going to be firing that upper pectoral muscle. And um, so, you know, if we are lifting like a heavy jar and putting it up on a shelf and we're going from the lateral side and adducting, that means to bring the arm across the body, um, up and adducting, that is when we're going to be firing that muscle. And so um, when we are doing our um, chest workouts and, and things like that, we'll usually use uh, a flat bench or we'll use a decline bench if we want to hit that lower pec and it's going to be the same thing for getting to our upper pec. And now this pe uh, bench I don't like because it doesn't have like a spot like right about here, which I would kind of feel would be a little bit more optimal. Um, this is just frankly too high uh, to hit that upper pec, pec. You're going to be using a lot more deltoid because there's a lot more upward motion. If you look at the fibers of your uh, upper pec muscle, um, your superior pec muscle, it kind of actually runs more lateral, right? A little bit down, but mostly lateral. So we're looking at that adduction. So the more that we have to actually lift up like this, the more that we're going to be recruiting that uh, deltoid muscle. So going too high with the bench is going to be one of the main things that's going to uh, inhibit when we're doing dumbbell work. And so we want to make sure, like if we were to draw those fibers in here, right, we want, we want to make sure that whatever angle that we're picking, um, we're going to try to match the bench to that angle, right? So this, my arm is always going to be pushing up with gravity, and so this plane is what I'm looking for, right? So I want to make sure that there's uh, some upward motion happening here along with that adduction. And one of the things, and this is uh, one of the reasons why I actually thought that this would be a great video to do, is when we're talking about uh, training, we want to make sure that we're uh, changing our variables in a way that's going to actually benefit our goal. So if we're look, talk about hypertrophy, right? If I'm doing my dumbbells up here, and uh, yes, I'm using fake dumbbells here because as you can see, there is nothing in my hand. Uh, so, you know, if you want to have a fake plate scandal like Jeff Cavalier, uh, now's the time to do it. But anyways, um, if I'm going to be uh, doing my, uh, let's say, barbell press, right? The thing about when we're doing a barbell press is that our hands will never actually get much adduction going on here. So the barbell is going to work this kind of range of motion, right, where my elbows go behind and I get a little bit of stretch in the upper pectoral muscle, um, which a lot of more recent studies have actually shown that uh, the point that we actually get the most, or where we start seeing the most hypertrophy, is that if we actually get some stretch in the target muscle when we are uh, on every rep, and that's going to actually trigger more growth response than uh, if we never go into that range of motion. But with when it comes to the uh, shoulder joint, when we get into this hyperextended motion, it's one of the reasons why we tell people not to bounce off your chest. Um, 
When we get into this hyperextended motion, the uh, head of the humerus will start to come out of the glenohumeral joint and it will kind of destabilize that. So we want to be really, really careful and we want to not necessarily be overloading, you know, in this upper range, right? Uh, if this lower range can't handle it because of that instability. So uh, we're going to be working kind of this lower range of motion, which is one of the reasons why you might actually feel a little bit more sore when you're doing a barbell press than a dumbbell press, because the dumbbell press will actually allow for that adduction. However, if I come here, right, if we look at uh, that adduction, when my arms are coming together, they're moving parallel to the earth, right? And that's a problem. So if what we're trying to do is we're trying to create the most stimulus uh, for that muscle. We want to make sure that we're having resistance throughout. So a dumbbell and barbell press, because the barbell will only go out to here, right? Whereas dumbbells will actually come in and they'll adduct more, but there isn't as much resistance in this last adduction phase because we are moving parallel to gravity. So in order for us to actually start to get that, I would almost have to come here and do kind of a fly motion, right? So I'm not saying, you know, I probably would have to like come this way, right? So that I don't have, I don't tweak out my core while I'm doing it. But then I could start doing like a dumbbell fly and get uh, more of that adduction because you see now I'm actually moving across gravity. Um, there are safer ways to do this. And obviously I don't have a cable cross here. So I can't uh, necessarily just, you know, make this happen, but um, I will hook this here. And so whenever I'm using any type of cable machine or I'm using uh, a band like this, right, the um, band points the, the direction of resistance. So if I am positioning my body, and so if you're imagining that there are two cables here, right, that are on either side of me, if I'm really, really far back in the machine, and I'm doing my fly here, and I'm coming up so you can see that there's a downward angle, this is actually a little bit lower, I want it probably around hip height, I don't want it necessarily too low, um, but I want to make sure that there's some uh, upward motion to it, right, as well as the adduction, if I'm really close to the machine, I what that's going to do is when I get into this end range of motion where my elbow, not my wrist, but my elbow is crossing my center line, um, when I get into that position, sorry, I have the thing flipped up so I can't actually see where I am in frame, so I apologize if I was standing out, but um, I want to make sure that my elbow is crossing that center line. Right. Um, the reason why I say elbow is that, especially as we get fatigued, we have this temp tendency to flare our elbows out, and then we'll count this as a uh, end range of motion. Right. That that um, we'll finish the call at the end of the rep. It's just like sticking your chin up when you're doing a chin up or doing a kip up. Right. And so, if I want to, like, if I stop here, look at how far I am from my end range of motion, right? Because I'm cueing off my hand, I'm just, I'm, I'm like, oh look, my hand is across in that line, but my elbow is not. My hand has no effect on my chest. It's actually just this segment that matters. So I wanna make sure that as I'm uh, trying to develop that upper chest, that I'm actually getting my elbow to get past my nipple line. Maybe not my sternum, but my nipple line for sure. And so I cannot necessarily cue off of my hands because again, as we get tired, we tend to bring those in closer and we do this kind of bear huggy motion. Um, and the more that we do that, the more elbow moves out and that shortens the range of motion, which brings me back to a point that uh, I forgot to mention here uh, when I was talking about the dumbbells. So if I get back down here, right? When I am doing a dumbbell press, and this is something that comes, or dumbbells or barbells or whatever, probably more likely barbell, um, in Olympic lifting and competitive powerlifting and stuff like that, people have this tendency to arch, right? And where is my chest here, right? What matters is the angle that my humerus uh, moves in relationship to my chest. So if I'm arching when I'm on a bench, regardless of what position it is, right, um, the angle that my, uh, that relationship between my chest and my humerus is going to change. So if I arch, now I'm in a flat bench press. I'm not gonna be hitting that upper pec at all because I'm arching. Um, so we want to make sure that 
we are actually keeping our hips connected and I actually like to push my belly button in so I flatten out against the bench here. And I know that that has become more controversial because people are like, oh look, I can move more weight when I arch. Well, um, some of that has to do with how you're setting your shoulders, right? Um, and trying to keep your upper back flat against the bench when uh, your arching becomes easier. But the other thing that happens, especially if you're working with a barbell, is that if you're cueing off of when the barbell makes contact with your chest, you're bringing your chest closer. And the hardest part of a bench press or an incline press or anything is going to be that bottom range of motion because the muscle is the most stretched. We are weaker when we are in the stretched position for the muscle. So if you are arching to get up, First of all, this is now a decline press. So I'm recruiting both my lower pectorials as a primary mover as well as my central pectorials. So I'm having more help here. But the other thing that's happening is I'm shortening that range of motion while also potentially putting my back in a destabilized position where I can actually start to injure myself. So by arching, you're actually kind of shooting yourself in the foot if what you're looking for is any type of real gains. Yes, you can move more weight, but that's not your goal. Your goal is to put on more muscle, right? It is to challenge and overload your muscles more. So, you know, just do the fucking exercise right so that you can actually progressively overload it and that you're actually going to see those gains rather than relying on some arch um, to shorten your range of motion so that you can feel like you're more powerful because you're moving more weight. So um, I would say try to keep your hips connected to the bench at all times, right? Um, and it is, it is ridiculous like how far people are, are going with that. So. Make it more challenging for you, not less. Um, and so the other thing that I kind of feel like I didn't mention directly, and so I'm gonna kind of backpedal here a little bit, is that when we were talking about the bench press, right, we're working this range of motion. If I am close to the cable machine, back as far as I can, arms on the cable machine as wide as possible, and I'm coming here, right, or and doing my bench press or flies here, right, um, I am working now that end range of motion. So those two exercises are going to be working completely different ranges of motion. A lot of people, when they get on the cable machine, they grab the handles and then they walk way away from the machine. What does that do? Is that when you get into the end range of motion, the lines will start to point directly parallel to your arm, right? And so you're not really working that adduction in, at the end range of motion. Um, is it wrong? No. It's just the same thing as if we, you were using a barbell right? You're uh, attacking that first range of motion, not the end range of motion. So choose where you stand based on which range of motion that you want to hit. Um, so if you're close to the machine, it's going to be the end range of motion. If you're far, far away from the machine, it's going to be the uh, beginning range of motion. If it is in the middle, then it's that middle range of motion. And so you, um, and you might not think that it's that big of a deal, but it, it really is. The next thing is, is that we need to make sure that we are doing uh, eccentric based training, not concentric, which means that uh, this pushing away motion, um, that is your concentric action. That's when that muscle that we're trying to target is going through the shortening phase. And we want to, you know, go ahead and press that however fast you want to. Technically speaking, you can, if you really, really want to be anal about it, one 1,000, two 1,000 right, is, is the textbook standard uh, that nobody does. And then, uh, but on the way back, and I really, really do encourage my clients to do this, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, push. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000. I will put on a fucking metronome, um, and you have to count four beats, you know, before you get to that end uh, range of motion, and you uh, perfect that over a period of time. If you are pumping it out, doing really fast reps, you're not gonna need that eccentric, you're not gonna be seeing those gains. The next thing that you could be doing if you really, really wanna just gain more size is you can start incorporating isometric training, which means that um, I'm gonna go, boom, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000, and then we're coming back. That's if you were using a cable, right? Because they went all the way together, I wanna make sure that I'm focusing on the end range of motion. Um, if I'm doing a barbell, right, I might pause here, 
right? I might pause even all the way back here. And when I pause all the way back here, what I'm gonna be doing is I wanna make sure that it's not resting on my chest. I don't wanna make sure I'm not like getting a break here. I actually wanna make sure that there's tension in that muscle, maybe even fe feeling like I'm squeezing my hands together on that bar um, so that I can get some of the adduction uh, in there as well. And I hold for four seconds down here, probably do it with a spotter because you might fatigue yourself a lot faster. You may have to go a little bit lighter, um, but you know, that is a, a way that you can start to approach it. So incorporate more time under training uh, protocols. And if you, if it's taking you, uh, you know, 45 seconds to a minute to complete your sets, like start the timer um, to be able to pump out, you know, eight to 10 reps, then uh, you're probably going to be seeing the most gains that you're probably ever seen in your life. And it's probably going to be ridiculously hard, but, um, you know, if you're doing your sets and you're finishing that 20 to 30 second window, you're not creating enough stimuli in order to uh, actually make muscle growth happen. So it's it's all about time under tension. It's about taking your time. It's about paying attention to when resistance is placed on that muscle. Um, another uh, principle that um, is a little bit controversial, which would be pre-fatiguing. So when we're talking about the upper pectorials, we I mentioned this before, that this... Um, anterior deltoid, you know, is an upward movement and it is one of the muscles that's going to be taking over for your upper pectoral as you fatigue. So if what you're trying to do is to uh, really, really target this upper pectoral, the controversial part is that immediately right before your set, do some front raises, do them thumbs up, just doom, 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 doom. Um, both at the same time, do them heavy uh, loaded or you can do them um, light and go up to 20 reps or whatever. Um, all we're trying to do is fatigue that muscle so it doesn't want to, right? We make it so it goes, okay, I don't want to be involved in this. The problem with that is that now that muscle that's supposed to be a stabilizer uh, in this particular movement is now going to be not useless. And so you might have a little bit of an instability in that joint. So be very careful with this, use a spotter. Um, but it is one way to kind of start to approach it, start thinking, okay, what are the other muscles that might be uh, contributing to this movement? You know, I might actually do a circuit where I start off with a decline press, right? This way I'm not hitting that upper pectoral at all. I'm hitting the bottom two pectorials and I just pound it out really, really hard, maybe with a lighter rep, so that they're not happy, helping with the adduction. Follow that immediately up with, you know, robots or, you know, front races at the same time or um, probably not an Arnold press if you're doing something that's gonna be using the triceps because I don't want those necessarily fatigued for this. And then I go into whatever movement I'm doing for the upper pectoral. And now what I've done is I've pre-fatigued the lower pecs, I pre-fatigued uh, the anterior deltoid, the uh, top, the superior pectoral here is now uh, on its own when it comes to completing this mo movement. And it's probably not, it's gonna be getting a lot less help from those other uh, muscles. So just be mindful for, uh, because another thing that can, will, can and probably is happening here is that your phosphocreatine is gonna be used up in that area. Your carbohydrate is gonna be more used up in that area. So you're probably not gonna be able to get as hard in that muscle because the other muscles around it have used up a lot of the resources of that region. Um, so. You know, there there are pros and cons to it. Um, if I were to suggest the the most sound approach, I would say be focusing on those eccentrics. Um, that way, we were focusing through a full range of motion. When we do isometric training, you only get uh, gains within 15 degrees of a strength gains within 15 degrees of the isometric hold. So you have to hold in all these various positions in order to see the most gain. Uh, from that. In fact, a lot of times the way that I would train clients when I was doing isometric training is I would go, okay, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, and I'd go through a full rep and then come back, um, you know, 20 degrees or so, and then I hit an isometric hold here, boom, full range of motion, three quarters back, um, isometric hold here. And if you're doing this on a cable machine, you can change your standing position so there's more emphasis on wherever you're having that isometric hold, right? And then back all the way here. So if I'm holding here, right, um, then I wanna be walked out further from the machine and I'll walk my way back as I work my way back to this position so my back is as close to the machine as possible. So I'm really, really focusing on the end range of motion. So um, 
that's pretty much what I've got for you as far as like how to really, really hone in on that upper pectoral muscle. A um, lot of concepts there. Uh, make sure that your nutrition's on point. Um, you know, have some protein. Make sure that you ha are hitting your uh, protein without like going overboard because again, I'm going to be doing a video very so shortly on uh, protein intake. In fact, I just got in a fight, in a fight with somebody over this uh, because somebody uh, said uh, 0.8 uh, kilograms per pound of body weight, which is and has never been the uh, the actual measurement. It's uh, 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight, not pound. And what that's going to do is it's going to go 2.2 times uh, what the actual uh, RDA is. Um, and granted, you know, depending on what you're really, really going after, yes, your protein intake will go up to a certain point. Um, I think it's around 1.6 to 1.8 kilograms per, uh, or pe uh, grams per kilogram of protein is uh, where the studies have shown that uh, it kind of tapers off and you don't see any further benefit from that. Um, whereas the, um, when you go, you know, 0.8 per pound of body weight, you actually overshoot that by quite a bit. So, um, and we'll cover that in another video. But um, for right now, you know, that's that's kind of my advice for you as far as like trying to develop that upper pectoral muscle. So I hope this is helpful. If you have further questions, please uh, put them in the comments below or talk to me. Uh, you can instant message me in the Telegram group. Um, I'm pretty active there. Um, some people do email me directly from um, the channel uh, email. Um, and, yeah, or you can start a conversation in the Facebook group that I know it's really, really dead over there, but, uh, you know, you can't force people to be active. So, all right, talk to you guys later.